Uh, started here. Um, we'll hit the play here and get it all put up. Was everybody ready? Okay, so my name is John Duffy. Um, I am the executive director for the Alabama Institute for Behavioral Health and Research. Um, I'm ha very happy to be here uh, to be speaking to all of you here at Auburn University. I haven't been here in a while. I graduated some time ago, so uh, all of this technology that we're looking at, these big big screens behind me and the, this auditorium type classroom environment is, is kind of new to me, but I think it's great for all of you, um, especially for those who are online. So this is the first time I've actually given a lecture where I have people online and people in front of me uh, at the same time, and all of this high technology is kind of cool. So today we're going to talk about the neuroscience of addiction and recovery. Again, I've kind of introduced myself. Uh, Education-wise, I got my Bachelor of Arts in Psychology right from here in Auburn University. Uh, not at the School of Nursing, where we are right now, where I'm talking to all of you now, but over in the Psychology Department. Um, I went from here to Wake Forest University, where I acquired a Master of Arts in Clinical Mental Health Counseling and am now a licensed counselor here in Alabama. I'm in private practice at uh, the Alabama Institute um, and um, practicing happily. And I'm currently a PhD student at Capella uh, pursuing a counseling education and uh, supervision PhD doctorate. So the goal there is, is to become uh, a teacher of counselors. Uh, I have a, a ton of publications. Research is one of my passions. I don't believe that you can practice psychology or counseling or nursing. You know, some of you in here are nurse practitioners. Some of you are from the medical school here at Auburn University, which I think is I'm very proud of to see that we have that here now. Um, I don't think that you can be a practitioner and not be a scientist at the same time. Uh, that's a, the true believer in me is is this bolder model of the scientist practitioner model of being a practitioner. And so I always believe that all of you here who are either undergraduate nursing students or graduate nurse practitioner students or medical students from over at the medical school who are here um, uh, listening to me, that it is important uh, that you contribute to the knowledge base in your professions that today it's not something where you can just be a consumer of knowledge, that because you're in the field, the very nature of your job puts you in direct contact with new phenomena. And so the questions and finding the answers to those questions and testing theories really starts not in academia, but in the field where, where all of us are in private practice and uh, practice in general. So let's get into what we're going to talk about. What we're going to talk about today is the central nervous system. We're going to talk about what parts of the central nervous system, what structures in the brain are affected or stimulated by drugs. We're going to talk about the long-term structural changes that take place and the concept of neuroplasticity. Uh, we're going to talk about neurotransmitters, which are chemical molecules that are uh, impacted or involved uh, with addiction and addictive behaviors. We also want to talk about the physiological impact of drug abuse, and we talk specifically about some organs such as the heart and lungs, the pancreas and liver, the kidneys. These all also have an impact uh, when they're impacted by drugs, and they have an, in an indirect impact on the brain through these damage to these organs. We want to talk also about behaviorist and learning theory and the addiction development you know, we want to talk about how it's developed, how it's maintained, and how it impacts treatment and recovery. Mainly, we want to talk about the SRC model, the stimulus response consequent model. We want to talk about positive and negative reinforcement and how that affects addictive behaviors and patterns of behavior. And we want to talk about behavioral modification as a mode of treatment along with some other things, behavioral, behavioral and cognitive concepts, um, along with some others, uh, medicinal, pharmaceutical, psychopharmacological uh, issues as well. And we want to talk about the psychological impact of drug addiction because I know many of you here are in the medical sciences, and so you're going to be talking about and you're going to be focusing a lot on chemistry and pharmacology and on things of this nature, the hardware of the brain itself and the rest of the body. But there is software in there too, right? 
or how we think these processes that take place that are not necessarily physiological but impact the physiological and are impacted by the physiological. So let's just dive right in there and talk about a couple of myths that I always want to dispel before we get into anything else. What do you know? And I know some of you are already shaking your heads about what you're reading on the on the uh, the slide here. So the first myth is is that addiction is a disorder of free will or, dis, or a disorder of morality. This could not be further from the truth. For any of you in here, has anybody in here ever had to quit smoking? Everybody tried to anybody try to quit smoking? I tried to quit smoking many times years ago, and it was very difficult. And any of you? Okay, you and you. Oh yeah, okay. There's a lot of you who have quit smoking. Did you quit? Just drop them and leave and walk away. Some people can. <clears throat> I've seen that happen. But have any? Yeah. So only like one of you were able to say that you were able to walk away from them and never touch them again. But for most of us, we had the will power. We had the the desire to stop. But did we stop when we wanted to stop? Didn't, did not did you tell yourself? I mean, yeah, you right here. Did you, did you tell yourself that I can quit anytime I want to? And then when you tried, something happened? Yeah, yeah. So it's not an issue of willpower alone. It's not an issue of your personal morals or the personal morals of another person addicted to a substance. It is a, a matter of behavioral conditioning, uh, both psychological and physiological um, dependency and um, addiction. And we're going to get into this as we go. The other myth is that vulnerability and maintenance of addiction is purely, and I'm stressing the word purely, a genetic predisposition. Now, what do I mean by that? There are some genetic markers that kind of indicate that once they're triggered, in other words, once the person is exposed to alcohol or cannabis or opioids and so on, then there's a trigger that may impact it, that makes them more vulnerable to develop addictive behaviors. However, the person is not born an addict because of genetics. People are born addicts because mama was using crack cocaine while the baby was developing, okay? This is not a genetic thing. So when you have a patient who's standing in front of you saying, I can't stop because it's genetic. My parents were, and therefore I, it's in my DNA. I can't stop. That's an excuse. That's trying to get shirk off the responsibility of, of getting off of it. That does not happen. It's a myth. So let's talk about the central nervous system, shall we? We're going to talk about the brain anatomy. We're going to talk about drug-stimulated structures. We're going to talk about changes in neuroplasticity and neurotransmitters. So here's a brain. This is a picture of a brain from several different views. Um, if we take a look at the superior view of the brain, and most of you who are in the graduate school, uh, nurse practice and medical school, you already know where to look. But for those of you who are here sitting in on this uh, kind of a uh, seminar kind of lecture, um, the superior view is in the lower left-hand corner. It's looking down on the, the top of the brain, looking down on the top of the brain as if you were above it. And as you can notice, there are two halves to the brain. Now, one of the things that I always, I can never eat a walnut and not think about the brain. Every time I crack open a walnut, I look at a brain. I see two halves. I see a corpus callosum even between it. And so I just keep thinking of it like it's a walnut. But there's a right side and a left side of the human brain. And then basically there's a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere, like a global hemisphere. If we take a look at the lateral view, which is just above that, we see the left hemisphere. And this is exposing the frontal lobe, which we see is number 13 in red. Uh, we also see the parietal lobe, which is three and nine together. The occipital lobe, uh, which is basically one, the cerebellum, which is the brown, kind of looks like a ball of yarn there, uh, 14, and then the temporal lobe, two. And when we go into a more sagittal view, we're now going to the right of that, we're going to be looking at um, the interior of the right hemisphere of the brain. And we can see uh, the frontal lobe in 13, 
Uh, three and nine are the parietal lobes. Uh, seven and one being part of the occipital lobe. The cerebellum is there, but we do not see the temporal lobe because the temporal lobe is an exterior lobe, uh, which would be on the opposite side of the view that we see for the right hemisphere. We also see the brain stem and we see um, the pons. This is where the respiratory systems. And we see the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland is an important gland because it is the gland that controls all other glands in the body. The cerebellum is responsible greatly for equilibrium and coordinated movement, walking, balance, things of that nature. And of course, that's in coordination with other parts of the brain, such as the temporal lobe, occipital lobe. It has to use a lot of different data points in order for the body to coordinate properly, including the parietal lobe, because the parietal lobe is responsible for uh, planning and muscle coordination, so psychomotor coordination. Uh, the frontal lobe deals a lot with learning it deals a lot with emotion control, um, and it deals a great deal with um, logic, memory, thought processing, cognitions, thinking. So the essence of your thinking, thoughts, um, learning, long and short term memory, all of these things, emotion regulation, are all taking place in the frontal lobes of the brain. Occipital lobe deals a lot with just exactly what it says, occipital lobe dealing with uh, vision. So the uh, optic nerve goes into the occipital lobe and then the information is uh, deciphered and then uh, shared among other parts of the brain that, are, that need to see it, which would include the frontal lobe to make judgments. So if we look at the inferior view of the human brain, it's kind of like we are holding the brain and looking at the bottom of the brain and it's in its hole. We see uh, on the right hand side is actually the left hemisphere and on the left hand side is actually the right hemisphere. And so we now see number two, the temporal lobes descending and we can see how they kind of work into the brain. Uh, we can see the cerebellum more clearly and we can see more of the frontal lobes. You can see that the frontal lobes really kind of wrap around just above the eye sockets, just above the eyeballs and the sinus cavity. In fact, the two antennae that you see, they look like antennae kind of sticking up there, um, are actually the olfactory nerves. This is how you smell. So just above the sinus cavity, they have nerves that go down into the sinus cavity and as air is passing by, particulate matter strikes it and it has certain smell. And these signals then go up and into the brain. And just to the base of those uh, olfactory nerves, you see two larger kind of V-shaped uh, items there. Those are the optic nerves going from the eyeballs. Um, and that actual area that you see right there, just above the uh, pituitary gland, is you, you're actually looking at what's called the optic chiasma. And chi being a Greek letter that looks like an X, uh, that's exactly what that does. It forms an X and the two cross and go into the occipital lobe opposite of each other. And so as we can see, this is basically the brain structure and what they do and how they work. And the, the temporal lobe deals a lot with um, emotions and a lot with learning and a lot with what? Hearing, right? Hearing. Now, if you take a look back at the lateral view, you'll see a number four. This part is called the Broca's area. And the Broca's area is, deals with the muscles of speech. And so this is how we form the shapes of our mouth in order to make words. Like you're hearing me speak right now. You see my jaw moving. Uh, you see my lips moving. My tongue is making certain shapes. My diaphragm is pushing air and the vocal cords are constricting to make sound waves. All of this is taking place because the Broca's area is coordinating it and working with the parietal lobe to execute it. So uh, in another area is the Wernicke's area, and this deals with language and understanding language, which is right around where the 11 area is, um, where you see 11, that's called Wernicke's area. And that deals again with written and spoken language comprehension. Okay, so let's talk about some of those chemicals that float about in the brain that are uh, either interact with or interacted or, or uh, are impacted by uh, foreign substances such as street drugs, cocaine, methamphetamines, Adderall, 
cannabinoids, opioids, alcohol, and so on. Let's start with adrenaline and noradrenaline. Now, I'm not used to this, and I think most of you in here are also more accustomed to hearing epinephrine. Am I right? Yeah, okay. So we're going to use the word epinephrine, even though on this, this slide it says adrenaline. Epinephrine is produced by the adrenal glands just above each kidney, and that's why it originally was called adrenaline. So it deals a lot with the fight-or-flight response. When um, we have a, when the amygdala in the brain sense a threat, they will signal the adrenal glands to release epinephrine. It floods the system. And this causes your heart rate to increase, your respiration to increase, so you're getting more oxygen to your body. It also causes the blood flow to go to the muscles. It also causes the muscles to have uh, more energy. And it, it cuts off blood flow and oxygen to non-essential organs. This would be the digestive tract and things of that nature. So that you have all the oxygen and all the nutrients and all the energy possible to do one of two things, either fight to survive or flee to survive or both, right? So in this case, uh, this causes the, this is the physiological fear response to fear. This is the feeling of fear. Does that make sense? When we talk about emotions and we talk about feelings, emotions are a brain thing. Feelings are a physiological thing. This is what we need to all remember. that The feelings, when we feel love, that's a physiological response. There's chemistry going on in the brain that's causing the body to do all kind of wacky things, right? When we feel in love, we, we get the little pitter-patter in our heart. We get the little, right? Get a little tingling in some places. <laughs> so, but the emotion of love is something different. It's a brain thing. Attachment is a brain thing. It's not physiologically felt. It's psychologically expressed and experienced. So feelings are physiological. That's why we say, how do you feel about that? Uh, I feel terrible. I feel good. I feel whatever. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm very attached to him. See? Okay, so once we have nor we have epinephrine into the system and we're all excited and we're very hypervigilant by the way the brain becomes very hypervigilant you're looking for threats and you're you're very quick to respond to things you can even it can even make you irritable now those of you who are thinking about panic attacks and anxiety you're dead on this is exactly what's happening the increased anxiety and panic now the body and the brain have a way of reducing that response when the threat is no longer present. That's called norepinephrine. And it's kind of like baking soda to acid, uh, baking soda to vinegar. It, it, gets, it neutralizes it, right? It brings the acidity out. So it's, you have um, epinephrine and anti-epinephrine, basically, and it neutralizes out the epinephrine. And all of those physiological responses that you feel when you are in a threat response situation, begin to go down. So here's the example. Let's say you're speeding down the highway. I see a lot of people laughing. I mean, did I just describe most of us in this room? I know I do, I speed every once in a while. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I've been lucky, I haven't been caught as much as I should be. You, you, yeah. How many people here speed? We all speed, right? We all find ourselves, we look at 30 miles an hour and we're going, that's ridiculous and we're going to do 40, 45, right? How many of us see 65 and do 75, right? Okay, so, you know, you're all laughing at me. I'm going, uh-huh, sure. Yeah, I see all of you. Um, somebody online right now is just commenting on there that they do more than that. And I'm like, ugh. <laughs> so, we're going to use the person online here. I'm not going to mention, yeah, I'm going to say, you know, Marissa here. We're going to use her She's doing 90 miles an hour in a 65 mile an hour zone. She's flying down 280. I'm sure that's 280, right? <laughs> yeah, it's 280. She's flying down 280, going from, from like Phoenix City or, or from Smith Station to Opelika, because everybody flies down that road. Whoever doesn't know about that road, they fly. I mean, I can be doing 65 and people will pass me like I'm going backwards. I could be doing 70, 75, and they will pass me like I'm going backwards. 
So let's say you're driving down that road and you go over a hill and just as you're cresting the hill, there's an Alabama state trooper right there on the side of the road and he's running radar, right? What's the first thing you do? Aside from yell, oh shit. <laughs> can I say that? I can say that in a classroom in college, right? Okay, yeah. Aside from say that, what's the next thing you do? You slam on the brakes without even thinking about it, right? You, you're hitting the brakes, you're slowing down, your heart rate goes up, you're hypervigilant, you're looking in that rear view mirror as you pass him, hoping he doesn't pull out behind you, right? Your heart's going, you're, high, you're, you're paying close attention to everything, stomach's tightening up, muscles are ready. And then you realize, luckily, he's not pulling out behind you. Maybe he's doing paperwork or something he didn't notice. But you're going down the road and you realize he's not pulling out behind you. And so as you go down the road, you start to feel less and less and less nervous. Your heart rate's going back down. Your respirations are going down. You're not quite so anxious. You're just not quite so observant. You're like, okay, whew, oh, well, man, everybody here, see, you're all laughing because you're like, yeah, I've been there. I know that. That's how epinephrine and norepinephrine work. When, you're, when you first see the threat, epinephrine surges the body and the brain, and you're just super excited. You're, just, you're just the fear response, right? But as time goes by, you begin to release more norepinephrine and less epinephrine, and so everything begins to calm back down. So it's, it's part of the balancing act, right? Now let's talk about dopamine. Dopamine plays a seriously, a very significant role in the conditioning or the reinforcing of addictive behavior. Why? Because dopamine is the pleasure neurotransmitter. It's released when we're feeling pleasure, when we're, it deals with, uh, it deals with movement and motivation. And people will repeat behaviors that cause dopamine to be released in elevated amounts in the brain. So what kind of behaviors would we repeat? Things that make us feel good? Things that give us praise? When people are praising us, we'll feel good. You know, that kind of a tingly down the spine we feel when somebody says, yeah, you did a great job. I did that. I accomplished it. People play sports because when they win the game, they get that dopamine rush. People have sex. Because when they reach orgasm, they have a dopamine rush, right? So people are more likely to repeat that the behavior that gives them that, that pleasure feeling, that, that dopamine rush. Well, methamphetamine, cocaine, alcohol, cannabis, opioids, all do the same thing. They trigger the release of dopamine. And so this is part of the high that they create. And so that's part of what they keep chasing. Now the problem is, and we'll get into that when we talk about the liver. I'm, I'm actually gonna save that till we talk about the liver. So dopamine is part of developing the reinforcers when we talk about the SRC model also, we'll get into that. Serotonin is a mood neurotransmitter. It deals with depression, but it also deals with sleep cycle. It's impacted because opioids will sometimes, what? Slow down that or increase it. But usually you'll find depressive symptoms because it becomes an, ag an antagonist and it doesn't allow serotonin to do its job. And so you find people with sleep problems, even though there are other issues that uh, opiates cause them to sleep more, but it's not because of serotonin balancing sleep, but their depression is very high. They tend to go into very deep depressions. Uh, but at the same time, somebody on meth never sleeps. They don't sleep for very long periods of time and then they crash. And so this is impacted. Serotonin, too much serotonin, you know, serotonin has to be balanced, like like leveling a scale, like you're using a weight balance scale, it has to be perfectly level in order for the person to be healthy, in order for them to have good sleep cycle or good circadian rhythm, in order for them to uh, be content and not depressed or, or overexciting 
or over uh, manic. If you have too much serotonin in the system, you can develop something called serotonin syndrome, which is very similar to a psychotic break, but it can be very similar to mania in a person with bipolar 1. Um, if you have too, too little serotonin, you have very uh, you have increased depression symptoms and a hard time sleeping. GABA is a calming neurotransmitter and is often in, is often used in calming the firing of neurons. And so a lot of times chemicals such as gabapentin are used to treat neuropathy, diabetic neuropathy especially, uh, because the neurons are firing so fast that people get phantom pains in the extremities, especially the legs. And so increasing the amount of GABA calms those nerves and allows um, for people to not feel pain, to the phantom pain. Increase it even further, they won't feel real pain either. So this deals a lot with the firing of the nerves, especially in the CNS. And high levels improve focus, though. Um, low levels cause anxiety. And it also contributes to motor control and vision. So, you know, this is another one of those neurotransmitters that has to be balanced. Too much can, can be harmful, too little can be harmful, but elevating it a little could also be beneficial and therapeutic. Acetylcholine deals with learning, and it is, is part of the memory and uh, short-term to long-term transition and encoding, encoding into short-term memory. It deals a great deal with thought and the use of imagination and creativity. It activates muscle action as well. It's one of the more common neurotransmitters, but when there's a whole lot of this, you also have the, the twitching kind of impact that is that occurs when you have uh, too much when you have methamphetamines and, and stimulants in the system. Glutamate is also a memory neurotransmitter, and it is the most common neurotransmitter in the brain. Uh, it's, it deals uh, a lot with learning. It deals a lot with memory. It regulates development. And uh, it also has a great deal to do with creation of nerve contacts, what we call neurogenesis. And, um, when we talk about neuroplasticity and the brain's ability to repair itself after sustaining some damage, this glutamate has a great deal to do with part of forming new connections and new networks that the, that the person can then utilize to uh, function more normally after sustaining damage. Endorphins. How many of us in here are joggers? How many of you exercise a lot? Yeah, go, oh my goodness. Well, you can tell. You can look at me in my nice Buddha belly here and know that I am a connoisseur of jogging and exercise, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I left the army and I stopped exercising. I should exercise more, right? It would, I would be a lot more healthy and happier. Why would I be a lot more healthy and happy? One, I'd lose weight, right? And I would be happy with my appearance in the mirror. Um, two... When you're exercising, how many of you in here run? How many of you, you know, run regularly, run marathons and stuff? Wow, gosh, that's a lot of you. And, and it shows, you all look really fit. It's really cool. Um, you're also half my age, so I'll just use that as an excuse. I'm old. <laughs> but how many of you have heard of, or ex more importantly, how many of you have experienced the runner's high? Wow, that's a lot of you. So, so uh, tell me, uh, yeah, you right there. Tell me, um, I know that the people who can, uh, I know that the people online probably, can you guys hear that online? Yeah, you can hear them online. I think that the recording of the, okay, the recording. So anybody who's listening to the recording is not going to hear you, but I'll, I'll kind of try to repeat what you say. So tell me, what's the runner's high feel like? Mm, yeah, it's like you're on a drug, right? You're you're high. You feel euphoric. You feeling euphoric? Okay. Yeah, it's a great feeling, right? So endorphins are released when we exercise, and it's a very complex molecule, as you can see on the slide. It's far more complex than any of the other molecules out there, and it deals a great deal. It gives that euphoric feeling, and it is also released when people are using street drugs. So if you combine that with the surge of dopamine. You've got two elements there that kind of reinforce the behavior. You have the euphoria and the, the happiness feeling of 
the endorphins, and then you've got the pleasure, the whole body-wide pleasure feeling of the dopamine every time they hit, they hit the drugs, right? Where else are endorphins released? During sex, right? Again, when we talk about evolution, sex takes a lot of energy to exchange zygotes to make babies. And if there wasn't something that rewarded the act, the sexual act, the union itself, would any of us do it? I mean, if there was no reward to it, I mean, I have a hard time getting off the couch to go switch the TV. If the, if the battery and the remote goes out, I, I just watch the same channel, even if it's boring. <laughs> I'm too lazy to do that. There has to be something that keeps people doing it or they won't do it. Think about that for a minute. We, are we thinking about how all the how the baby that's produced from this is going to be a teenager one day? And we're going to have to parent the teenager <laughs> when we're thinking about sex? No, we're thinking about that reward, the big O, right? And so the release of these two chemicals is what keeps us coming back for more. And then we worry about the headache of raising children later, right? So... Or child support. <laughs> yeah, he had a funny one there. Yeah, or child support later, right? Okay, so endorphins deal with that. So these are the major eight uh, neurotransmitters that deal with, that are impacted or or, in, or influenced in one way or another by drug use. Um, there are hundreds of neurotransmitters in the brain that do all kinds of different functions. And it's kind of unique how they combine to send different messages between neurons. Now, how are these messages sent between neurons using these chemicals? And that's a very interesting question, isn't it? I want you to first take a look at the first, the top row, when we talk about adrenaline in them. I want you to look at all of these molecules. And they kind of look like house keys or keys that could go in a lock. And if you can imagine a switch that you have to put the key in and then, and then turn the key to make the switch work, and then it, you know, it only works once, right? And the key comes back out. I want you to think about it working like that. Every time the key hits that hole, it only works, the, the, the key only works in certain locks. And so, and then it triggers, right? Opens up or switch, flips the switch. It's because now we're gonna talk about neurons. And there are several different types of neurons. We're only gonna use this model because it's the easiest to kind of explain and get through because we really wanna to get to how chemicals are exchanging information and how they're impacted by drugs. But there are, unipolar and bipolar and all kinds of different types of neurons in here. And we're going to deal with this one particular unidirectional nerve, uh, the most common one that's used. So on the left here, you're seeing the, the most common type of nerve that's out there. And you'll see that there's something called the cell body. Now, for most of us who take anatomy, we know this as what? Not a cell body, but what? The soma, right? This is the soma. And the neuron operates like any other cell in the human body. It has a nucleus, it has organelles, it has all of the metabolistic processes that take place. Um, it produces waste like any other cell. It, it consumes nutrients like any other cell. Uh, and so we see in the soma, the nucleus in there, the little circle in there. Now, from the exterior of the soma, you see some branch looking things there. It looks like roots in a tree. And these are called dendrites. And the dendrites are receivers of information from other neurons. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. Now, from the dendrites, information is received and impulses, electrical impulses, are then pushed along through the soma, from the soma into the axon hillock, and from the axon hillock into the actual axon, which is kind of like you see, it looks like a, 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 a line or a pipeline there that has these little bubbles around it called the myelin sheath. And the myelin sheath is actually parts of other cells called glial cells. And they wrap around and insulate the axon in order to allow the electrical pulses. They kind of insulate it like, like the rubber insulation on a wire insulates wires. And so, but there's another purpose for glial cells to provide that myelin sheath. It connects them together and it allows them to create a structure within the brain that keeps the neural network together, but also allows it to be flexible and plastic in an environment that's very ch that changes and moves a lot. So this is how neurons are kept kind of kept together. 
but not together in a way where they entangle and cross, where signals get, get uh, you know, you kind of have short circuits, so to speak. This prevents that. Now, as the axon goes down, it turns into a bunch of other branches, and these branches are kind of like the branches of the tree, and they're called the terminal branches. And at the end of each of these branches is something called a terminal button. And when you look to the right image, you see this, this kind of a button looking thing, like an onion shape, uh, like a Hershey's Kiss kind of thing there. And that's the terminal button. Now on the opposite side of the terminal button is something called the postsynaptic neuron. That's actually one of the dendrites of another neuron. So if you look just up to the upper left-hand corner of that same right-hand picture, you'll see another axon coming into the dendrites. And then there's this little bitty square that's kind of expanded into this synapse. Now the connection, it, this whole connection right there that you see in that picture is called a synapse. And the gap between the postsynaptic neuron and the, and the presynaptic synaptic button or terminal button is called the synaptic gap. Some people call it the synaptic cleft. And this is where the chemicals, those neurotransmitters we talked about, are released and received, uh, released by one, by the terminal button, and received by the postsynaptic neuron, the dendrite of the next cell. So as we see inside the terminal button, you see these little circles, and they have these little dots in there, right? Those dots are those molecules. Each one of those vesicles, those little bubbles, contain a specific neurotransmitter. And as the electrical signals are received at the terminal button, that determines which of these vesicles are pushed to the end of the terminal button and release, they open up and release the chemicals into the synaptic gap, which then float across to the postsynaptic neuron. Now you see these little bitty kind of blue looking things on the postsynaptic neuron, and there's some blowed up, blowed up. Oh my goodness, where did I learn that? There's some blown up uh, images to the lower left-hand corner, and you can see where one of the neurotransmitters has gone in like a key. It has inserted and activated this channel. As soon as it makes contact, it opens and closes, and then the, the neuron bounces off. It's kind of like ping pong bouncing off, and it's constantly doing like this: pop, pop, pop. And every time it bounces into it, it opens that channel, and that channel opens and opens and opens, but that channel will only open to certain molecules. So there are thousands, millions, hundreds of thousands of receptors that are specifically designed to receive and activate to specific molecules. These are the neurotransmitters, the chemicals. So as you can see, they're constantly releasing. So as a neuron is electrically firing, it kind of goes pop, 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 right? As these pulses, and they pulse at different rates and different styles because this is how information is being sent. So as they're firing, pop, 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 That's how it sounds when we're actually trying to make that to sound when we're doing, when we're tracing nerve communication. As that's happening, that's actually triggering the release of different um, neurotransmitters into the, the synaptic, into the synapses of all these different neuronal connections. And so the receiving neurons are receiving these things. Now, drugs, how do they impact this? Well, they have about two different ways they can do it. They can either be an agonist or an antagonist to the regular neurotransmitters and how they're doing their job. Also medicines, medicinal purposes. So let's talk about that. You can have the regular uh, drug, natural substance, which would be your neurotransmitters, right? So you'd have your dopamines, your serotonins, your acetylcholines, all of these going on, your um, uh, endorphins, all of these are going on. As you can see, they're square shape, kind of diamond shape, however you want to look at it. And they're going into the receptor and they're uh, triggering the receptors and the, there's normal cellular activity going on between the pre and postsynaptic neurons. Now the agonist drug acts kind of like a copy of the neurotransmitter. And so when it gets in there, it hyperactivates the nervous system. 
because now you have the same receptor responding to a molecule that is so similar to the natural molecule that it, it activates. So now instead of pop, 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 now it's going pop, 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 pop. Now where would you see that happening? Usually speed, methamphetamines, anything that is a stimulant would be an agonist because now it's speeding up the cells, right? But in some cases, they can also be an antagonist because they can also be acting as a block. They can be blocking, they can attach to the receptor area and block the natural substance from triggering. Do you see what's going on? They can stop them from triggering um, the normal cellular activity, which would decrease the cellular activity. GABA is a good example of of decreasing activity. So instead of pop, 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 now the, the, the transmission turns into pop, 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 pop. Where would we see this? Depressants tend to depress the nervous system, slow it down. And so this is where we would see that happening. Do you see what's happening? So they're agonist and antagonist. Now here's the funny thing is that many of the drugs that people use, they don't come alone. It's not just THC from marijuana that people are smoking. There's carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. There's about a hundred other carcinogenic compounds in there. And there's other, those chemical compounds are having an, a heyday in the central nervous system as well. Cigarettes, nicotine isn't the only thing that we're putting in our system. Uh, cocaine, hydrochloride, powder coke. The solvent used to pull cocaine out of coca leaves is gasoline. And there is a ton, including lead, uh, being snorted into the nose and absorbed into the body through the mucous membranes. So they kind of have multiple impact on the, in the central nervous system. There's the agonist and the antagonist. It's kind of like a duality of drugs. Drugs have a duality to them. And so what we see is that some, like stimulants, can be an agonist for dopamine while being an antagonist for serotonin. It can be, an, uh, opiates can be an agonist for endorphin and GABA, but an antagonist for serotonin and vagal route neurotransmitters. Alcohol can be a depressant, right? But also release dopamine, be an agonist for dopamine. You see how that's going? Everybody, everybody with me on that? Okay. So now we're going to move into some other things. Let's talk about the body. Let's talk about the rest of the body and the organs in the body that are impacted by long-term chronic drug use. Um, not only are these organs affected in a most profoundly negative way, but they also impact the central nervous system because these are the organs that either take toxins out of the system or they provide nutrients for the system, which includes the brain. So let's talk about the, we're going to talk about what happens to the brain directly. So chronic drug use can lead to the atrophication of the brain. Um, those of you who are med students, I'm sure you guys have heard of atrophy. Um, have any of the rest of you heard of what atrophication means to an organ, to the brain? Yeah, it mean, yeah, you're right. It means shrinking. It means it's, it's shrinking and it's losing mass. Um, so when the tissue of the brain atrophies, it leads to damage because the glial cells and the neurons themselves are dying and they're not regenerating. And so the brain is shrinking and sh kind of shriveling and pancaking and kind of, it's really looking ugly. And we're going to see some pictures of that. Um, and that happens over time. <clears throat> now, the more serious the damage is done, uh, the less likely it is the damage will be repaired. Also, the older the person gets, the more rigid and less plastic the brain is to physical damage. So a younger person who sustains physical damage to the brain by, by chemistry or by blunt trauma has a higher chance of neurogenesis resulting in new connections than an older person. So the older the person is, the more permanent damage becomes in the central nervous system. Now, there are some research studies and some experiments going on in the medical field that deal with stem cells um, that seem to show some promise in that regard. But 
again, I'm not the medical doctor. You get, you guys got have some professors that can probably tell you a lot more about that, but there is some research that sounds pretty promising. But for the most part, chronic drug use, the person starts using drugs in their teens or in their young 20s. If you can get them off in their, in their 20s or early 30s, chances are that they, there's some recovery here and, and maintained 80%, 90% functionality. But when they're in their 40s and carrying on, once the damage is done, it's pretty much done. Right? So this shrinking brain causes a lot of cognitive problems. It causes a lot of neurological problems like coordination, uh, thought, reasoning, judgment. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, perception. Um, even the ability to understand spoken language or instructions. Focus, concentration, ability to learn, memory problems, motor, uh, psychomotor problems, tics, twitches. Um, it can even develop something very similar to Parkinson's, kind of a Parkinsonism disorder. So atrophy of tissue damage that leads to psychomotor dysfunction, right? Now, there's are other issues that can involve here, too. It's called arterial stenosis. Now, anybody who, who is familiar with people who smoke marijuana, I'm not going to ask anybody in here if they do. <laughs> but and I hope you don't, because it's not as medicinal as people want you to believe it is. Um... But I will tell you, uh, stenosis of the arterial structures and the venous structures in the brain result from people who eat a lot of junk food. High LDLs, high, high uh, cholesterol levels tend to result in stenosis and hardening or, or um, uh, thinning of the arterial blood flow in the carotid arteries and in the arteries in the... Um, in the brain structure itself, which can lead to TIAs and or stroke. These are very permanent damages to the brain and can be fatal. In the lungs, you can also develop something called atypical TB, and there's a number of diseases that can be classified as atypical TB. It's not a tuberculosis of the type that you're familiar with reading about a lot. Um, in Southeast Asia, and in South America, there are a number of diseases that can find themselves in the lungs, just like anthrax, um, that are spread by spores. So the spores can kind of hibernate until the environment is right for them to start multiplying. And so when you smoke weed, when you smoke hashish, when you snort coke, these are not purified, right? You're smoking, you're snorting, you're inhaling these particles, these spores. They get into your lungs. Now, here's the thing. They are very hard to cure and almost always terminal. Faster than cancer, just as deadly as cancer in your lungs. So what happens? You can develop cancer. Now, when I tell people all the time, they keep saying, oh, marijuana is safer than cigarettes bull crap okay all of you in here are medical students all of you have you have you have you talked about this with your professors with the medical science that's out there okay good good now the problem is is that when i talk to people who are not medical professionals and and not psychologists and, and counselors um, I always get this stuff. No, I saw on the internet that it's safer than cigarettes. It's medicine. It's got medicinal properties. You're all laughing. I can't keep a straight face either. It's all crap. I mean, from, from most of us who treat substance addiction, that is nothing but an excuse to maintain the habit. But it's also a reflection on ignorance and the lack of education of people who of the common people who are out there they honestly believe that smoking marijuana will not cause them cancer that it will cure glaucoma but all of us here know that there's over a hundred well over a hundred carcinogenic compounds in, in marijuana when it's smoked that the chances of getting cancer lung cancer esophageal cancer oral cancer is just as high as it is if you're smoking cigarettes or any type of tobacco. It's just as high.
And so, and I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but I, it makes me feel better to just bring it out. It causes lung cancer. It causes esophageal cancer. It causes throat. It causes uh, laryngeal. It causes um, oral cancer just as much as cigarettes do. So just to get that little bit of high from dopamine, to get that little bit of high from endorphin released from it, just like with nicotine, they're going to risk the de entire destruction of their lungs. Not only the entire destruction of their lungs, but atypical TB on top of it. So with the constant aggravation of this stuff coming in and out of the lungs, you also develop something called chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder or disease, the COPD. Now, COPD, for a lot of people, you think can be cured. It cannot, right? You guys, have you guys learned about pulmonary diseases yet? Okay. It cannot be cured. You can only slow its progression down, but you cannot cure COPD. Once they develop it, it's it. It's a downhill slope from there. And yet, they will smoke the hell out of marijuana, thinking, fooling themselves, into believing that this crap they're putting in their lungs is, is, is not going to kill them. So, it gets worse when we talk about crack cocaine and smoking meth, right? Because now we're putting acids, we're putting sulfur into the lungs, which mixes with what? Water. And when you mix sulfur and water together, what do you get? Sulfuric acid. So when you're smoking crack cocaine, you're literally baking, you're literally burning your lungs with acid. Same thing with meth. Meth even worse. So now we're doing all of these continuous damages to the lungs, which eventually lead to cancer because of the carcinogenic impact. So what happens when the lungs are not functioning? You're not getting enough oxygen into the system. The brain is not receiving enough oxygen, and there's the, then the carbon dioxide that the brain, that the, all the cells in the body produce, are not is not being exhaled properly. It's not being exited from the body or filtered out of the body properly. So now you have a buildup of CO2 in the body and the impact of hypoxia on the central nervous system, which not only slows down the central nervous system and causes it to malfunction in, in areas of cognition and judgment and reasoning and focus and concentration and sleep and depressive regulation, emotional regulation, and so on, but it also causes the cells to start dying and atrophication of the brain ensues. Let's talk about the heart. Arterial sclerosis, which is a hardening of the arteries. Arterial stenosis, which is a blocking of the arteries, can lead to severe heart disease. Damage to the heart can lead to congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure means you're not moving all the fluid out of the extremities like you should be able to. This buildup causes swelling. It also causes problems with getting oxygen and nutrients to the brain. It can lead to stroke. It can lead to heart attack and death. All of this. Can anybody here, I know the, maybe the medical students and the nurse practitioner students, this is a challenge to the undergraduate students here, are, heavy, are more likely to be heavy drinkers, right? With all the sororities and fraternities and all the party opportunities. What is the number one drug that causes heart disease? There's two of them, really, but the one that is known to cause heart damage. Can you guys know anybody? Who are, who are my undergrads that are in here listening? Okay, tell me. <clears throat> smoking is one of the two, but it's not the top one. But smoking does cause damage to the heart. Anybody else know? Alcohol. Drinking damages the heart. Chronic alcohol exposure damages the heart, the muscles, and even the neuronal connections between the natural pacemaker and the heart itself. The neuron it literally cooks the heart. And when I was at Wake Forest, I had the opportunity to go over to the medical school that was there and observe. Um, they took a heart from a pig and they put it in ethyl alcohol and it cooked the heart tissue cooked it like you'd put it on a grill. The heart tissue, the muscle tissue of the heart. So, yes, the heart can be damaged by chronic drug use. That's just alcohol. Imagine when you're putting other chemicals in your body that come along with cocaine and, and methamphetamines. 
The kidneys. Adrenal failure is terminal unless you can get a kidney transplant. Now here's something I want to tell you about livers, kidneys, and lung transplants. If you are an active addict, if the, if the patient is actively addicted and not in control of their addictive behavior, there is not a surgeon on the planet that will put that patient on a list for a new liver or a new kidney or a new, pair, a new lung. They have got to come off of whatever the drug is that's damaging that organ. Because in their minds, those organs are so rare, they want them to go to somebody who is going to appreciate it and take care of it. They're not going to give it to somebody who's going to squander it. And I can't say I blame them. Can you? Uh, no. I mean, these are future surgeons sitting all in here, right? Would you? When you have a whole line of people who, who, would, who would take much better care of it and live much longer lives because if they receive that same organ... So this is something important that when you're dealing with your patients who are at addicts, I'm very quick to tell them too. You don't say you're going to get a liver transplant and keep drinking. It's not going to happen. So kidneys with adrenal failure. You can also develop kidney stones over calcifications and, and of minerals. They can get together in the kidneys and start to develop. Uh, you can also develop chronic kidney uh, infections and UTIs. Um, they happen quite frequently with people who are uh, heavy drug users and I'm not exactly sure why. I'd like to talk to some of these medical students or maybe some of the professors over at the medical school and kind of get an idea. But there is a high statistic there for drug use and alcohol abuse and uh, kidney infections and UTIs. I suspect that it has a lot to do with hygiene. Uh, does it? Okay, good. Oh, I'm glad to know that. I'm glad that, that you guys are telling me this because hygiene is one of the things that gets abandoned by addicts, especially of stronger drugs. They tend to not bathe for days and days, right? And so I'm thinking that UTIs are probably a part of poor hygiene. The liver, sclerosis of the liver, also known as cirrhosis of the liver, is a hardening of the liver uh, that's caused by um, damage to the liver that is not repaired by liver tissue, but rather filled by fat tissue. And that fat eventually hardens. And the more fat you get in your liver, those of you who've heard of a fatty liver, this is a fatty liver is the predecessor to cirrhosis. And the less liver tissue you have processing out the impurities and the toxins in your body, um, the more toxic your system becomes and the closer to death you get. Uh, you can develop things like jaundice. Any of you see somebody who drinks a lot and they have the whites of their eyes are yellow? Uh, yeah, yeah, you've seen that. These are chronic drinkers who have very serious liver prob function problems. Um, how many people have seen heavy drinkers who have a stomach that looks kind of like an inverted kettle? Like a, we call it kettle belly. That's a very inflamed liver. It's huge uh, on the front of the body. Um, so you can also develop liver cancer, which is extremely aggressive and metast metastasizes very quickly. So uh, in, in regard to this, let's talk about the pancreas. Does anybody know what the number one cause of pancreatic cancer is? I don't... Does anybody? I got med students in here and I got nurse practitioner doctoral students in here. Somebody should know. No? Or you just don't want to say? What about online? Anybody? I'm looking. Nobody wants to say? Smoking. Smoking. Which includes marijuana is the number one cause of pancreatic cancer. You cannot get a pancreas, trans, uh, you can't get a transplanted pancreas. Once cancer sets in, it's very hard. You have to catch it very, 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 very early. If you don't, it metastasizes very quickly and death is guaranteed. It is a very aggressive cancer. So if you look at the guy from, what was it, Jeopardy? He died of pancreatic cancer, long-term smoker. Patrick Swayze, long-time smoker, pantry, pec, you know, pancreatic cancer, all dead. Um, so, let's take a look at some pictures of some really gnarly stuff. Over to the left is a human lung. Now, I want you to t pay very close attention to the, um, this lung. 
you will see some black or kind of bluish looking dots all over this lung. Each one of those dots is a smoked cigarette or a smoked marijuana cigarette. Could also be smoked crack. The carbon from smoked marijuana or smoked cigarettes invades the inner tissues of the lung and is, as a defense mechanism, is transported to the surface of the lungs. And so the lungs start to turn kind of black and bluish. And so these lungs, um, they get these little pinpricks of carbon and contaminant. And each one of those are, it's basically bubbles of chemicals that are cancerous. They can cause cancer. They're carcinogenic. Now, right in the middle of that lung, I want you to take a really good look at that fatty looking junk. Do you know what that is? Yeah, yeah, all of you are right. You got it right on the head. That is cancer. But here's something I want you to look at with that cancer. Look at how many black and blue dots are in the cancer itself. This person continued to smoke whatever it was he, was, he or she was smoking, even with the cancer. Can you believe that? Look at that. But for those of you who smoke, this is what your lungs are looking like. That's not a healthy lung at all. Now the good news is, is that when you quit smoking over years, the body does get rid of these contaminants. These little blue dots do eventually go away. But it takes a long time. Now let's look to the right of that. I've got two brains. The one to the right is a healthy brain. The one to the left is an unhealthy, atrophied brain. This is not Parkinson's. This is not Alzheimer's. This is the brain of a chronic crack cocaine user. Can you see how it has shrunk? You can't even really distinguish the temporal lobes anymore. The occipital lobe is almost gone, and the parietal lobe and part of the uh, occipital lobe has pancaked. It has literally collapsed in on itself. This is this this person was a vegetable before he or she died. Complete vegetable. So let's look in the lower left hand corner. You see two livers. You see a healthy liver with a gallbladder. That little green part is the gallbladder right underneath it. And to the right, you see a cirrhotic liver, cirrhosis or sclerotic liver. And as you can see, the little yellow bubbly looking things that are in that liver, um, that's fat tissue. That's fat tissue um, that is replaced damaged tissue. The liver has been damaged so chronically and so frequently that it could not repair itself, and those, those damaged areas, those ulcerations, were filled with fat. Now, you see the more red, hard-looking parts of that liver. That's where that fat turned into a very hard, almost brittle kind of material. That's dead, necrotic liver. That's, it's gone. There is no liver. As a matter of fact, that liver is so cirrhotic that there's no liver. I can't see any liver tissue left. Do you see any liver tissue left? I don't see any. In fact, in the upper right-hand corner, I actually see a splotch of green, which looks like it might be gangrenous. Now, to the right of that, I want you to take a look at that thing. What do you guys think that is? Take a good guess. Now, any of you guys had anatomy and gone to a cadaver lab yet or anything? Okay, so some of you are. Do, do you guys recognize it? Do you recognize that organ? You do. Okay, tell me. Tell everybody. Say again. It's a pancreas. Yeah, that is a cancerous pancreas. And there is not one bit, except for that very small amount in the center nor near the left. There is not one bit of that organ left. It is all cancer. And this is a very painful death for people. It is, if it's not caught very early, it is guaranteed this person will not survive. And it's caused by smoking. And ple people, please tell your patients, it is not just smoking cigarettes or smoking pipes or sm it's smoking anything. You can be smoking marijuana. You could be smoking tobacco. You could be smoking crack cocaine, methamphetamine. They all damage the pancreas. So 
Let's get on to the psychological impact of drugs. Learned or conditioned behaviors. Learned helplessness. We're going to talk about negative cognitive distortions and major depression. Now, learning theory and behavior modification are big parts of, of some of what we do for substance addiction. Now, this is not the only treatment approach out there. There are a number of them that are, are equally, if not better, as far as successes and outcomes go. The reason for that is, is that no two people are exactly alike. So you can't come up with a theory or treatment process that is like a cookie cutter. You know, one size fits all, one, size, one, one treatment method works for all. It just doesn't work that way. In fact, even among you as medical scientists and as, as medical future medical practitioners, um, even you can see where um, the chemistry of the human body is different to certain levels. Some respond to medicines better than others. Some respond to procedures better than others. So it's the same thing with the human mind. And so we want to talk about how things are reinforced. How is the behavior reinforced? And one of the things that explains it the best is when we talk about learning theory and we talk about behavioral modification. So we want to talk about the SRC model. What is the SRC model? It is the stimulus response consequent model. So basically what's happening here is that you have a stimulus or a desire to accomplish something that elicits a response. And the consequence of that response or that behavior is the product, the consequence is the product of the response. Now that consequent can either punish or reinforce the response in the future when, a, when the same or similar stimulus is presented to the person. Now, what are some of the stimuli that will lead to uh, behavioral consequences or will lead to patterns of addiction? One is thrill-seeking, right? Teenagers, young 20s, you know, they want to get out and they want to get a thrill. They want to, oh, we get to drink and we didn't get to drink before. We get to smoke some, some crazy weed. All of this kind of stuff. Some people want relief from pain. Now, it doesn't have to necessarily be physical pain, does it? It can be emotional pain, right? They're self-medicating for post-traumatic stress disorder. Or they're abusing drugs uh, or they get hooked on drugs as a part of uh, pain management. Happens a lot. Uh, what about enhancing performance? Steroids, right? Enhancing performance. Where else? How about here in college? Where would you see people abusing a particular drug to enhance their performance academically? Adderall, right? A lot of people will take Adderall because it increases their focus, concentration, memory, etc. And they get hooked on it. Xanax, another one. So when we talk about reinforcement and punishment, this, this is what I want you to look at. When a person responds to a stimulus, the consequent will either increase the likelihood that the person will repeat that response when the same or similar stimulus is presented in the future, or it will decrease the likelihood that that response will be chosen or, or manifested when the same or similar stimulus is presented in the future. So if it increases the likelihood that it will happen again, it's called a reinforcer. If it decreases the likelihood that it will happen again, it's called a punisher. Now, when we talk about negative and positive reinforcement and negative and positive punisher, it is very important that you realize, that you keep in your mind, that it is not a morality or right and wrong inference. Positive and negative simply means adding or subtracting something. So let's use some examples. Let's say you have a headache. Let's say that, that person A has a headache. And cognitively, he goes through his options, because there is a cognitive element here that, that, that is kind of frequently overlooked. But he goes through his option, and he chooses aspirin, right? Person A takes aspirin when he has a headache. The headache is the stimulus, the desire to get rid of the, head, the pain is the stimulus, the response is take an aspirin. He takes the aspirin, which is the response, the behavior, and the consequence is that the headache goes away, the pain is taken away. Now, is he more likely or less likely 
to use aspirin when he has a headache again in the future. He's more likely to use it again, right? Because it worked this time, he'll do it again. So did it add something or take something away? It took the pain away. So it is a negative reinforcer. Now, if he gets a headache and he decides his response is to bang his head against the wall, and the consequence is he has more pain and not less pain, it becomes a punisher, right? Because he's less likely to bang his head against the wall in the future when he has a headache. But since it's adding more pain, it's a positive punisher. See how that works? Everybody, everybody with me? So what happens when we use a drug? We have, let's say we're feeling emotionally down. We're having post-traumatic stress disorder. We drink alcohol to get rid of it. It releases um, endorphins and it releases dopamine and we feel better and we feel euphoric. Are we more likely to use alcohol the next time our anxiety symptoms from PTSD arise? Sure. It's reinforcing it. Is it adding or taking away something? That's the trick, isn't it? It's, it's adding euphoria and feeling good, but it, is it taking away the pain he's feeling? No, it's not. It's always there. He's never really getting rid of it. He's just masking it with what he's adding. So it's a positive reinforcement. See how that's working? And that loop is what keeps him coming back. That's why it's so hard to just quit on willpower alone. So increasing the reward. Now here's something else. The liver processes, it creates enzymes. So let's use alcohol for instance. Every time a person drinks and they get that nice high, they get drunk, the liver produces enzymes that break down the alcohol very rapidly to take it out of the system because it's a poison. So the next time the person drinks, it takes more alcohol to reach that same high. And then the liver develops even more enzymes. And now it takes even more alcohol to get that high. We call it chasing the high, right? And so now the interval, in this case, the volume or the number of drinks it takes to get that same reward increases. And now there, it reaches a point where it's just the alcohol itself. And then the full reward, the full high, isn't actually being attained in some cases. Incredible, isn't it? So let's talk about vulnerabilities to the development of uh, addictive behaviors. One of those that we know of, there's that debate between nature versus nurture, genetics versus uh, socialization. I'm one of those who believes, among others, that it is a combination of some genetic predispositions or triggers, right, and vicarious learning. Children who grow up in drug-affected homes learn addictive behaviors vicariously by watching, by observing. This becomes their, no their, their normal. Dad coming home drunk, fighting with mom, becomes normal. The, the healthy becomes abnormal and the unhealthy becomes normal. Now, this presents an additional vulnerability to opting for drugs because this is what they saw their parents and others doing in their family. They would opt for drugs or alcohol to self-medicate or to escape because this is what they, their, model, their, their models were doing, right? This is what their parents were modeling for them because that unhealthy behavior becomes their normal. And the healthy behavior is not abnormal but completely foreign to them. And so they grow up. And there, of course, is this ongoing debate between genetic predisposition. There is some research that shows that, that certain markers in our DNA may activate and contribute to addictive behavior development 
when once the body is exposed to a certain substance, but <clears throat> it's very, it, it's not as solid as the nurture side of the argument is, but it's there. So let's talk about cognitive distortions. Cognitive distortions are kind of like self thoughts that prevent us from doing things that prevent us from seeing who we really are and from actually achieving our full potential. As future practitioners working with patients who are going to have problems, you're going to run into these distortions as hindrances, as excuses to not, uh, to, as hindrances to motivation, basically. Filtering is one of those. And when we filter, we see only the negative things and we filter out all of the positive things. So every, no matter what situation this person looks at, they only see the negative and they ignore the positive in that situation. Even if the negative they're seeing in that situation is the most unlikely of, of it entirely, the most unlikely, most improbable interpretation of what's really going on there. That is how they will see it. So trying is always going to be failure, which is part of the polarized thinking we're going to get to next. Polarized thinking is also known as black and white thinking, and black and white thinking means either it is or it isn't. Either I'm going to make it or I'm not. And most of the time they're thinking negative, right? It's a negative cognition here saying, you know, I'm not going to make it. Period. Overgeneralizing. This is where everything is based on a single negative event. I didn't, I tried to quit and I failed. Therefore, every time I try to quit, I'm going to fail. <clears throat> that is the biggest obstacle to get a person to overcome when it comes to substance addiction. What about fortune telling? We've got people who jump to conclusions without much evidence, right? We do that all the time. A lot of people do that. How many times do we go to a office party and somebody looks across the room at us and we just automatically assume that they hate our guts or that, you know, that means something really negative about us when in fact it probably means nothing at all. That happens all the time. Catastrophizing. This is another big one for substance addiction. And this is where they see the absolute worst possible outcome in any situation or an outcome of any effort. And it kind of goes hand in hand with overgeneralizing. Not only did they fail the first time and therefore I'm going to fail every time, but when I fail this time, it's really going to be bad. It's going to be a catastrophe. Kind of hard to get over the catastrophizing, right? What about personalizing? You know, personalizing can sometimes be a hindrance because when you're doing that confrontation, when you're doing that intervention, as some of us like to call it, well, they see everything as a personal attack against him. So when you're being as gentle as possible, no matter what you do, it's still going to be, you hate my guts, I hate you back, right? But you've still got to get that information across. These are some of the barriers you're going to run into. These aren't the only ones. These are the most common ones. So how do the drugs impact the CNS? Well, once one, we know vascular stenosis in and around the brain reduces blood flow and oxygen to the brain, but it also reduces the removal of carbon dioxide and other byproduct waste. Hypoxia symptoms can form and they reduce cognition and processing speed. It can also increase lethargy. It can be, uh, it can also create a very increased chance of uh, transient ischemic attack or mini stroke or full stroke. Um, death of glial cells and neuronal entanglement can result, which kind of, kind of creates that atrophying brain and that it's part of that atrophying brain that kind of creates a Parkinson's-like uh, disorder disease. Metastasized cancer cells can invade the brain and the spinal cord and regions that are, um, you know, they can, well, they, they can cause very severe damage to both the brain and the spinal cord. And some of these, depending on where and the age of the person, some of these damages can be permanent. But then we have some neuroplasticity that we know about where some of these nerves can, act, these, some of these cells can actually regenerate and new connections be created. The problem is, is that in some cases, tumors that form in the brain can be in places where it is impossible to remove them surgically without causing the death or even further damage to the individual. 
We can also end up with things like hypertension that's generated by chronic stimulant use. That also furthers the risk of stroke or embolism. Toxicosis due to the buildup of waste in the bloodstream. This would be because of problems with the liver and with kidney failure. That also contributes to significant damage to the nervous system. Let's get on to stages of change. Now, I think the reason I include this for all of you as practitioners is because this is going to give you an idea of where your patient is when it comes to wanting or being motivated to make a change in their drug use, alcohol use uh, habits, right? Or their, their uh, problem. So we start at pre-contemplation. And pre-contemplation is the place where we really hate to see a person be at. Because this is the person who says, I don't have a problem. Everybody else has the problem. They're not thinking about it. They're not contemplating it at all. And then there's contemplation. And contemplation involves, I might have a problem. But they're not willing to take any further steps on it. They're kind of ambivalent. Yeah, yeah, maybe I drink too much, but whatever. Then they go into, now in this case it says preparation, but I like to call it determination. This is where the person determines, yes, I've got a problem. Um, I, I think I need to do something about it, but they're not quite taking action yet. But this is the part where they're getting to where I need to do something. I'm, and this is where the problems are becoming persistent. They're becoming more self-aware. Then they take action. In most cases, they're going to go to a detox and inpatient rehab, uh, followed by an out intensive outpatient or IOP, um, and uh, then they will enter into maintenance. This is where they'll go to AA, NA, other things uh, in order to maintain their sobriety. Now, if you look in the middle of that, one of the things I want all of you to understand is that with substance addiction, with recovery, Relapse is normal, and it's going to happen several times. Let's go back to when I was talking to you about quitting cigarettes. How many times did you relapse in trying to quit smoking? I did many times. I can't even count how many times I failed to quit smoking before I actually had to get somebody to help me stop. It's part of the process, so expect it to happen normalize it don't overreact to it don't criticize the patient don't make the patient or in my cases i would say client but you're all doctors so it'll be a patient um just okay let's start again you can do this a lot of motivational right motivational interviewing motivational counseling you really want to stay there hey this happens it's okay i'm here you're here you know, let's start again. Let's do this again. We'll do it again, and we'll do it again, and we'll do it again until you get it. We can, you, you can do this. There's no time limit here. You're not failing. As long as you're still trying, you're not failing. So be expecting relapse. Relapse is a normal part of the process, okay? So let's talk about some psychological comorbidities that go with substance addiction. Now, for me, I specialize in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, for both military sexual trauma, combat, um, and general sexual trauma, even adult survivors of child abuse and child molestation. And when it comes to PTSD, I almost always, I mean in a very high percentage, run into a comorbidity of alcoholism or drug use. And so, but there are other issues. Major depressive disorder can be a comorbidity. Generalized anxiety disorder can be a comorbidity. Chronic insomnia is, is a comorbidity, and almost always that chronic insomnia is part of either the substance addiction itself or it's affiliated with something like PTSD. Panic disorder, antisocial personality disorders can sometimes develop, with, especially with the stimulant use. And post-traumatic stress disorder, this is where you have the self-medicating behaviors. For generalized anxiety disorder and major depressive disorder, and post-traumatic post stress disorder uh, and panic disorder, you usually find that they're self-medicating. Um, when you come into something that's like an antisocial personality disorder um, or chronic insomnia, these are usually byproducts of the drug itself. Almost always when I see that, I don't diagnose it alone. 
because I can't differentiate between if it's a chemically imposed thing or not until we start treating the substance addiction. So, are there any questions, comments, or hand grenades about what's going on here? You can always contact me um, at 334-540-0315. You can also visit the website. It's up here on the post. You have handouts of these slides, so you, you have them with you. Uh, my, my email is on here, both of my emails. One of the things that I really want to tell all of you being Auburn students is, is that once you graduate from Auburn University, you get to keep your Auburn email for the rest of your life. And so my Auburn email is right there to the right, and my office address is on the bottom. So uh, without any further ado, we will um, uh, kind of stop it.